These stories sometimes contain mature content and language for adult audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Because I knew I had to be quick. And I knew when I said them three things and that door squeaking like it did, I knew once I opened it, I'd have to run. What way am I going to run? You know, I said, just don't think about that. Just run straight, run straight, go up and up and up. Welcome to Digging Deep, True Stories of Big Change. Each episode of this podcast digs deep into one person's story of change to reveal a little bit about how and why we make big changes in our lives and what can be learned from these experiences. I'm your host, Kelly Styring, founder and principal researcher from Insight Farm, a consultancy that helps companies learn from their customers and consumers through deep conversation and connection, often told as stories like the one you'll hear on this podcast. So let's get the conversation started. Today's guest is Kathy Shaw, survivor of a brutal attack at a time when victim blaming was common and women had little recourse for this type of harm. Coming forward years later has helped Kathy heal, but at the same time, it's created a Gordian knot of jurisdictional control and leaves a crime completely unsolved. I'll be interested in your thoughts after hearing her story today. This is a bit of a tough story. I'll, I'll admit yes, it. It's, it's... I'm just very thankful to be here and to be walking and be alive. I'm very, 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 very lucky that I was probably one of the few that did escape him. And I know there's more out there. Maybe tell me about how old you were and where you were living before it happened. Well, I was actually 25 years old. This happened in North Carolina. I come in from Florida with my sister uh, and a friend, he drove. We come in a big old white vehicle. He was um, a really good friend of my sister's and she begged me to go with her. And I'm like, okay, hopped in and she was on her way to see an old friend. And he was actually incarcerated. She was gonna bring him in some cigarettes and go visit. I guess everybody got a little bit lost and it was getting late and everybody was tired and um, it was too late for her to go by and see this old friend. So they decided to stop off in a tavern. And and I'm sorry, were they looking for a place to stay for the night or were they just there for some drinks and some food? No, they were actually there for a drink and a good time, I believe, you know, to dance and have a nice time and have a drink and chat. And But as quick as the door opened, I knew that that to the tavern, I knew it wasn't a nice place. It was more like a <laughs> kind of a very rough looking, uh, I want to say a rough looking redneck type tavern. They were all really out of control. That wasn't me. So we kind of got into a little argument, me and my sister. I told her, that's not me. You know, I hate that you're going in there, but if you choose to, that's your business. And so you had this argument with your sister. Did you leave right away to walk? I kind of contemplated whether I really wanted to leave or try to go in there, make up with her, because I didn't know where I was going, what I was going to do. I just knew possibly I was going to go find a pay phone and call my parents and, you know, try to get maybe a bus ticket or airplane ticket to go back home and just start all over. Can you describe for me this this tavern? What type of road is it on? Is it on a highway or a small dirt road? Like what kind of scene and what time of day are we talking about? Uh, it, it must have been about seven, eight at night. It was, you know, it was a little bit dusk, getting dark. It was on a very rural area. It was kind of in a corner and it had three steps to it. it kind of looked like a big old house, big old white door. I'll never forget that. Like I said, you know, it opened and I took one look inside and it was really, really rowdy. Do you remember when you were there. And I know you were young and you were probably not driving the car. Is that right? No. <laughs> okay. And so sometimes when we're young and we're not driving, we don't pay that much attention to, to roads. But do you know if it was when you left, um, do you know if you went north or south or east or west? Do you know what direction you were walking? Well, I actually went to the right. So that would have been, um, I just remember seeing a 29 marker. 
29 marker and I was kind of headed, I want to say north. Okay, like a mile marker. Yes. What were you hoping to find when you walked up the road? I thought that if I kept on walking, maybe, you know, maybe three or four blocks or so, I would eventually find a small town or find a country store on the corner where there'd be in some type of a payphone. So I kind of kneeled down at a church that I passed and prayed that I would make it, you know, I would be okay, and which I was very scared, you know, I was very scared. It was getting dark. That's when I actually heard the noise of a very loud, I knew it was a pickup truck, an old, old, like a clunker. It kept uh, dying out. Seemed like something that was about to fall apart. You know, it was very old and I could tell it was something big, like a pickup or a, and I noticed I was being followed. I looked to the left and before I knew it, uh, I seen this man. He had like a strigly reddish brown hair, shoulder length, kind of wind blowed looking, had a red cap on. I'll never forget the red cap like a baseball cap or a cap with some letters on it, some kind of a writing. Um, he had big, very evil looking eyes, very like, like he was looking through you, just very evil eyes. Had an old white t-shirt on, um, I could see, and I noticed he had a bottle of some kind of whiskey or something in his hand. Now, at this point, was he still in the truck or was he out of yes. the truck? Yes. Okay. Yes, I can see. And was see he was... talking to you? Was he asking something from you? Yes. He asked me if I needed a ride and I said, no, sir. I was very polite about it. No, sir. I'm walking. I'm just going up the road a little bit. I know somebody because I just felt very, you know, I was very uncomfortable when I took a look at his face. He, very, very spooky guy. Very, mm -hmm. very scary looking. I noticed he started the truck up and it just kept dying out, dying out. He would move and stall, move and stall. Before I knew it, I, I started to run a little bit, you know, walk fast as kind of like running. And um, I was very scared because I didn't hear the truck anymore. And before I knew it, you know, I felt something on my hair. I had very long curly hair. He was out, he was chasing me, and he had me by the head of the hair. And I turned around, and before I knew it, he had one of the sharpest knives. He pulled a button to this pocket knife. He pulled like a button. He pushed on, down on it, and it was the sharpest blade and the longest I've ever seen in my life. He put it to my neck, and he said, don't try to scream, and you're coming with me. He kind of drug me in the truck by the head of the hair and he threw me in there and then he put his hand over my mouth and he put the the passenger door, he pushed the lock down and pushed me over to him as he was holding the knife and he just took off driving. You know, he went very fast and um, I was very close to him. He made sure that I was, you know, sitting right beside him. Did you notice any more details about the truck itself? Yes. It was a light bluish type dark blue. It had a lot of tools on the back. And I noticed a ruler. I noticed some paint. A lot of tools, straps and things like that. Looked like he seemed to be maybe either a construction worker, a carpentry worker, which he was wearing blue jeans. They had like black grease in the kneecap area, black grease, black like oil. And so now you're, you're in this truck. How are you feeling at this point? Of course, I'm terrified. I'm in shock. I'm shaking very bad. I'm shaking so bad to where I couldn't even, you know, move or scream anything. I pretty much froze up. I feel like I, you know, went into a deep shock, which I'm, I'm sure I did. And mm -hmm. I just yelled, you know, where are you taking me? And he never answered. He just, um, pretty much told me to be quiet, sit still. And he just drove very fast. And then about 15 miles up the road, or 15, 20 minutes, I seen the right turn signal go on to the truck. I'll never forget the right turn signal. I pay attention to things like that. And 
He went over some sand dunes, like uh, little slumps, like uh, they were little like, uh, I want to say hills, but they were tiny, like made of sand. Now, and at this as, point, were you still on a road? We're off road onto okay. a side, like he just went over a bunch of humps, like sand humps. Mm -hmm. And he went way into a corner and I noticed there was like an old telephone factory with big black poles up in the air and the grass was real long. It was dead looking and he stopped at a house. There was a fenced in yard. It was kind of brick white around it. It had a fence, uh, two little kids inside it. They looked maybe to be about two and three years old, they were in diapers, eating popsicles. I sat there and kind of was staring at the kids like, where is he? You know, where are we? And I don't know who this place is, who this house is. And the kids were waving at me. And and he told me that he was going to run in and grab something. And he told me if I tried to run from the truck, he had a gun and he'd blow my well, he said effing brains out is how he said it. He was in and out in a matter of seconds. And um, he had this little like rust colored bag and he had some yellow twisted rope with an anchor hanging on it. He got in very fast this time, very quick. He went over those humps and sand was flying. It was like, you know, in my eye, it was kind of blinded me. There was so much sand. The right turn signal went on again, and he went up about another 17 minutes and then turned off, made a U-turn to the left. Then he made another right, and I seen the sign, and it had a big sign. It said Rock Quarry. And so what did the quarry look like when you arrived there? Well, it was just a bunch of sand, humps. You know, he went flying down in there. He went quite a ways down in there. And we went over a lot of sand dunes, rocks. I mean, he hit rocks. It was way down in there. Was it there was water? Pretty, was there water in this? I corn? seen a little bit of water, yes. Okay. Like towards the rocks. I didn't look too deep into it. I was more or less paying attention to him and sure. watching every action, every move. And I was just so terrified, you know. And then he kept driving way down in there and he just come to a dead end stop and it was overlooking a rock. You know, a rock was just kind of like overlapping another rock. It was hanging there except very high in the air and he just parked underneath it. It was like he knew where to go, knew where, like he's been there a lot. He was just, he knew where he was going mm -hmm. and he took the gun out of his pocket and he put it to my head and he told me I had the count of three to take my GD MF and clothes off or you're a dead B-I-T-C-H is exactly how he worded it and he started counting and of course I did what he said you know I did I complied to every single thing I wanted to come out alive, you know, and I really didn't think I was, <laughs> I was, you know, sexually assaulted repeatedly. And I'll never forget, I was, you know, very thirsty. I had to urinate, which uh, he told me to go outside. He followed me around outside. And um, after I was sexually assaulted, he kept banging the steering wheel over and over and over. And like he was mad at someone. He kept saying that G-D-B-I-T-C-H over and over and over. And that's what really, I believe, scared me and traumatized me more than anything. How long did this go on? Four days and four nights. And so during that time, did you sleep? Were you tied no. up? No. No. I was free and not tied up and I never went to sleep. I... I was so wide awake to see every little thing he did. And, you know, I. Did he give you any food or water? No, there was nothing to eat. I, I wasn't even hungry, but um, I was very thirsty, though. I can tell you that much. But he was loading the gun, unloading it. I mean, I watched that over and over and over like a rerun. It was just banging the steering wheel. He was screaming at someone like he was so angry at 
possibly a lady, because he said the B-I-T-C-H word. And then he stopped every 30 minutes and sipped on his whiskey. He had a bottle of whiskey. And I noticed, you know, he was getting drunker and drunker and more slobberier. And, you know, the next morning he was still at it and same old thing. And I was, you know, assaulted again. And I just knew the third day that he wasn't acting right. He was too droggy. And I just, you know, knew that he kept hitting the steering wheel with his head. But he, he got right back up, though, in a heartbeat. He got right back up. When the fourth day come, the early morning, and when I heard him snoring, I knew right there that could be my chance. But you know something? I really and truly, I was so traumatized and so terrified and so scared to open that door. It was so old and squeaky. I just knew that he would wake up and everything ran through my head. Every plan just, you know, and I really didn't know if I wanted to even try to escape. Also, you've had no food or water, so you have to be feeling pretty lightheaded and, and weak at this point. Well, too. I think I was in such a shock to where I didn't know if I had enough energy to run. And but so, I, so describe you know, for me that moment when you made that choice to to try. Oh gosh, what I did, I quietly grabbed every stitch of clothing I had and put it on me very quietly, and I said, Kathy. You're going to count to three, and you're going to make your run. And I did count to three. I counted to three several times, but nothing. I just couldn't pick myself up to open that door. So about an hour of contemplating, I finally got my clothing on, opened the door very quietly. I must have took a good 20 minutes to actually do it carefully and know that I, you know, he wouldn't wake up. And, oh my gosh, as quick as I got everything on, I just counted to three. And I said, well, which way do I go to myself, you know? So I just said, go straight, go straight. One, two, three, run. When you're, you're at this quarry, are you down? Like, are you climbing up out of a hole or is it more flat? No, I'm climbing out of a hole. You're climbing it's out of a very, hole. Oh, oh yes. So very, you're looking very. for a road or a path, or are you just going? I'm just going. Okay. Is it daytime or nighttime? It's dawn, the break of dawn. It's about six or seven in the morning. The sun, I was just setting up. And so yeah. you take off. Then what happens? Well, I ran a good probably 30 minutes. It wasn't easy. I kept on tripping and falling. There were so many rocks and mud and water and slush. And, you know, I seen the break of dawn. I seen the moon coming out, the sunshine. I heard a lot of highway noise. And I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, here I am. I'm, I'm going to be make it to the top of this road. With the grace of God, I did. And I seen an SUV coming, a white SUV. And I threw my hands up and I was screaming. And they pulled over aside in the matter of a heartbeat. And they opened the door and asked. I was crying. My clothes were torn. I looked like hell and back. I looked terrible. But And um, they told me, do you want to go to the police or the hospital? I said, please just get me to a gas station. You know, get me to a gas station. At the same time, there he was up the road. He, he evidently woke up and he hollered at me, watch out for the G, D, M, F, and snakes, and took off to the right as fast as he could. Just now he to, was on foot at this point? No, he was in the pickup truck. So he was in the truck, okay. Yes. Right. Just as evil as can be once he wore off whatever he was on his drinking. Mm -hmm. but, and um, I just screamed and screamed and screamed at him. How did you know where to get in touch with your sister at that point? Well, probably out with, um, she met a guy in the tavern. She was with him and, um, and she didn't even know that I was in the same town with her still. She thought I had took a plane back home and went back to mom and dad's. He had like a pager type thing. It was her friend. 
And so right after this happened, you were able to get to your sister through this pager, through this friend's pager. But then what did you do? Did you stay in North Carolina? Did you go to Florida? Um, what was your approach to your recovery? No, she come back and seen me and she hugged me and cried. You know, I can't blame everything on her like I've been doing. I was kind of mad at her for a long time because I walked and she didn't follow with me and she let me walk. But that was me that chose this. And she hugged me. She cried so hard when she seen my, you know, clothes torn. She was with a man. She met him in the tavern. And I was telling her the story right in front of him. I felt comfortable with my sister there. And she cried and hugged me. And, you know, she was very sorry. You know, she she could not believe what happened. She thought that I had got a plane ticket or a bus. And, you know, I was back at home. So let's talk about the choice that you made not to go to the police at that time. I wish to this day I would have, but you know, I was bought to a gas station where I had plenty of water. I had a pay phone to call my sister. I was very blaming myself, which I would never do again. I just wanted to be a shell and a snail. I just wanted to go somewhere and hide, you know, go take a shower and just hide, you know, and keep my mouth quiet. I, I wasn't ever going to tell a soul but my sister, which, you know, had picked me up and seen me. So you said, you know, take me to a gas station. You have a phone. You have water. The police are not an option. You're feeling uncomfortable with that. Um, I was very uncomfortable but, because I didn't know how to come out and say it. You know, right. I, I'm a woman. They're a man. And I was 25. And I didn't want to come out and say, you know, I've just been, you know. Right. So at that point, did you just go back to your life or did you have any therapy? Well, or? Uh, my sister and me and her friend, we went back to Florida is where we drove from Florida. And um, I went back to my regular life. You know, I was a uh, waitress uh, running a restaurant. I'd, I'd done all that. Very hard worker. I am very, very hard worker. And, um, of course, I, I got married to a Navy guy, and he was very abusive, and we divorced after 10 years of marriage. We had two sons together, and then I married the second time around a restaurant owner, and I was married to him about eight years, and um, we, we ran the restaurant, and then we divorced, and why I had the restaurant, I had a relative that was being attacked by a predator. He was raping my nephew and he was hurting my son as well. And, you know, I didn't believe a lot of it at first until I actually caught it. So I got involved in this case and the prosecuting county attorney, he asked me why I took such time and really worked this case and, and risk my life, you know, took myself. And I told him my story. Now, he's the one that made me actually get in my car and make a report. I was never going to do that. He said, you need to make this report. He said, do you know it's not fair to other women out there? And I was thinking, what does he mean by not fair to other women? But I, I understand he could have, you know, got a hold of a lot of other women that could possibly have not escaped or he assaulted them or killed them, you know. So when you reported this, what was the response of law enforcement? They looked at me like awfully awkward, you know, and um, they're probably thinking, well, why didn't this lady, you know, report this a long time ago? And I said, hey, you know, if you don't want to believe me, fine. If you believe me, that's fine. He asked me a lot of questions and I told him and he did a lie detector's test. I passed it, of course. He asked me if I provoked it with any type of see-through clothing. And then he took me to Burlington. It was a state capital. And they gave me some eyes, nose, a mouth. And I put together a black and white sketch. Then he took me from there to the rock quarry. It seems like it was called... Pinnacle or something like that, Pinnacle or, and 
he let me out, you know, I was looking down in the rock quarry and I kind of got a lot out of me. It was really the best night of my life because I was screaming loud looking down, you know, I beat you, you son of a, I was just, you know, hysterical. This case remains unsolved. Oh, yes, of course. You know where it is? Do they still have it in Rockingham? Is it still in their jurisdiction in the Oh, case yes, files? It's, in the, it's in the wrong jurisdiction. So when you say it's in the wrong jurisdiction, what do you mean by that? It's sitting in the wrong jurisdiction. It's Which in jurisdiction? Do you know? Rockingham it's in, County. And it's not supposed to be there? No, ma'am. You know Where why? Where does this occur? Yeah. Haswell County, North Carolina was where the rock quarry was. Okay. I that understand. Wasn't, that wasn't where I walked from and where they took me from was Rockingham. Caswell County was the crime scene. Okay. The rock quarry. Well, it depends on what crime we're talking about because the crime of kidnapping probably happened in Rockingham. Well, yes. It, right. Kidnap and, you know, assault and all that. But uh, they had three different detectives in Caswell County. Once they got the case there, one detective started with it for a year. He passed it to the next one because he quit or retired. Was that um, recently? It was, it was about in 2000 and maybe eight or something. Then he passed it to a third person that was there, maybe a captain or something. They passed it back and forth to each other for another two or three years. And they argued with Rockingham County up until right now, up until six months ago. I called and they said, uh, it's not our case. And I said, Rockingham County had a meeting. They had a meeting with the SBI, the FBI, the sheriff, the state police, the jurisdiction people. The case 100% belongs to Caswell County. You know how many times it's been passed? 18 times back and forth. So let's talk about before this attack occurred. How did you feel about yourself at that time as a 25-year-old person? Oh, gosh, I was very confident, independent, hardworking, very much a lady. And what about after the attack? How were you feeling about After yourself? the attack, how I felt, like trash, like garbage, like I would never trust men again. I hated men, you know, and I, my, my trust was gone totally. Now let's talk a little bit about how you felt before and after you started to tell your story. So some years went by. How were you feeling about yourself at that time? Oh, I, I felt great because I was getting this out of my system. It was kind of like my story that I kept inside all them years. It was like releasing a time bomb. I mean, I was overwhelmed to be able to tell him and he listened. Have you had any therapy or counseling? Uh, very little. I'm still jittery. I'm still real nervous. My concentration's bad and Mm -hmm. I thought about going to get some help for PTSD, but I just don't want to be in any kind of drugs. Does that make sense? I can, I can overcome it myself, and I have, just by telling my story and writing. I love to write. I write and write and write. <laughs> well, tell me a little bit about what your plans are now. So you're telling your story. What are you looking for? What are you expecting? Well, it just feels good to come out come out with it and have somebody to listen to me and hear me. And when you hold something like that in for years, it's not easy. You know, you, I was on the verge of, um, I just didn't want to go on. I, I wanted to end my life. I really did. I had no reason to go on. I had what no kept you, What changed your mind? What kept you from um, doing that in the moment? Well, in life, I had children. That was my, that's my rock. <laughs> that was my big thing there. And staying busy. What kind of justice are you looking for? Well, I'm hoping one day that the story comes out and it unravels and somebody can maybe, you know, at least try to find him, you know, do so, let people know. 
uh, I just feel like somebody should be accountable for not taking this case. It's just sitting there. Thank you for joining us today on Digging Deep, True Stories of Big Change. I'm your host, Kelly Styring, founder and principal researcher from Insight Farm. At Insight Farm, we help companies make their products better through conversation and connection with consumers, often told as stories like the one you've heard today. If you'd like us to help you with consumer research, or if you'd like to participate in this podcast and tell your story, reach out at www.insightfarm.com. We look forward to the conversation.